So uh, Alex is traveling, so he asked me to come in to give a le guest lecture. So today I'm going to give you guys an uh, introduction to machine learning in computer vision. So many of this stuff is quite basics. I guess I will go through it really fast. But if you have questions, you can interrupt me anytime. Um, so first of all, the slides uh, is in my uh, personal page. So Junwei uh, and my initial last name initial. So just a bit, a little bit about me. I'm a PhD student in computer science, um, and my research area is uh, computer vision and multimedia processing. Alex is my uh, advisor, so. I have done projects in object detection and tracking, and also activity detection um, in videos, and also have done uh, activity future uh, prediction, and also uh, weekly supervised learning and question answering. And recently, we also have a shooter localization system and 3D re event reconstruction. And so, overview of today's lecture, I will um, talk through a bit about data-driven machine learning basics and the and some basic classifiers. I think you guys are, are very familiar with it. K-nearest okay. neighbor and also what's loss function and what's a linear classifier, SVM, and also the optimization methods, stochastic gradient descent, and then our um, talk about neural networks and convolutional neural networks, and then mostly about the uh, other interesting computer vision tasks like video classification, object detection, and question answering. And all of these projects have code repos repositories, so you guys can try it out. And there are a lot of useful image video data sets that you can use for your homework to get better performance. So these are the basics. I will go through pretty fast. So I guess, I guess uh, all of you guys, sorry? Where is, where is this slide? Um, so here goes, go to the, so, or you can just search my name on, search my name on Google, and you go to my personal website. website. Scroll down and you see the site. OK. So are you guys familiar with uh, image classification task? <coughs> Anyone have done any classification? Image classification? One, two, three? OK. So I will go through it really fast. Uh, so as we all know, image are saved uh, as a h times w times 3 tensor. So basically, each, so, so there are three channels in images, RGB channel, and each of them uh, is saved as a, a number between 0 and 255. And usually, they are saved in uh, integers. And for image classification, the task is to, given an image like this, you want to have, out, you want the model to output a label, which is a multi-class mm -hmm. class classification problem. So we will re represent the image classification model as uh, y equals f of x and w. w is the model weights. And S is the input image. This classification model is a very general representation. Usually, in papers, in the problem description section, we will just we'll use that um, representation. So modern CNN models usually takes the their input of the image. So uh, as we all know, that image nowadays is of high resolution. But the CNN model we use usually crop the images, usually take the mid, um, they resize them and then take the middle, the center crop of the image for classification. And the size is, is usually, uh, they can only be as large as 320 times 320 for modern uh, CNN model. They are trained on this uh, image size, but they can test on uh, other size, other resolution as well. So do you guys know uh, ImageNet classification challenge? Yeah, so this is the one of the most uh, important image data set in computer vision. 
and there are the challenge has like 1.4 million images, and the task is to classify a thousand object class, given one image, and classify the image. And as you, if you look at this graph, this is the performance uh, throughout the years. And this last column is the human performance. You can see the y-axis is the error rate, error rate. So you can see human is like 5.1% 5, 5 uh, error. And in recent years, like 2017, uh, well, in 2015, the ResNet already passed human performance. They have like 3.6% uh, accuracy, 3.6% uh, error. Error rate. So why isn't human perfect? Does anyone know? In this case, so this is a. Um, so I have. So the image net is collected through what we call Amazon Mechanical Turk. So basically, it's a website where you can give bounties for Turkers. What we call is the annotators throughout the country or throughout the world. So they will complete your task. For example, here is image classification, right? Uh, for a small amount of money. So, so you can't avoid there are a lot, some people that will just, uh, maybe they are tired because they might do this task for a day or, or they just don't focus. So the error comes from uh, this kind of inevitable inevitable uh, sort of uh, human error. But if you imagine that, for example, for, for me, if I do this task like uh, foc very focused uh, one hour a day, I can get the error rate down to zero, uh, nearly to zero. But this is not scalable. So in most data set, there will be some sort of uh, human error rate because of the way that they collect the data. Yeah, just some personal experience on, M on AMT. Yeah. So a, a brief history, history about the metrics. So in 2010, the first, uh, uh, the first challenge winner is uh, they, they used um, local features like SIFT and HOG. Are you guys, have you? I think Alex may have mentioned that features already. Those are the local features popular then. Um, and then they, since they are, these are local features, that means in each location in the image, you have uh, some dimension, uh, some feature uh, representation at each location of the uh, image. So you need to, some, you have to, to have some encoding method to have a fixed length vector. And they use back of words um, like in NLP, and then the classification model, they use a linear SVM, support vector machine. Do you guys know support, support vector machines? Yeah. So that's the winner then, and you can see that they only got 70% accuracy. And then notably, I think AlexNet is the start of the computer vision, as the CNN works. Um, and then there's the Wii GGNet, and 2016 we have ResNet. And nowadays, in many tasks like object detection and activity uh, activity detection, those computer vision tasks they all use uh, they still consider ResNet as a strong backbone. Backbone meaning um, low level feature. The yeah. Um, okay, some data-driven machine learning basics. So I guess you guys are very familiar with it, but just bear with me, sort of like a revise of this. this. I think this could be very helpful after you have done research for years and you, you kind of look bad, look at the basics. Um, so uh, for machine learning to solve, to use machine learning to solve image classification, this is what we call supervised learning. So basically, you first collect a data set with images and labels. You have to have human uh, annotated labels. 
and the data set is represented by uh, image and label pairs. And you can see here that representation means that you have n image pair, image and label pairs. And then you have a training set for learning a classifier. And then you use a validation set to set, select optimal hyperparameters. And then you evaluate the classifier on a whole out test set. So, and there are other types of machine learning categories like unsupervised learning, which means you don't have any labels. And semi-supervised learning, semi -supervised learning, you have part of labels. And reinforcement learning, uh, you create an environment for the model to learn. So for the, the famous AlphaGo and whatever agent in the Dota uh, uh, OpenAI open release, they all use reinforcement learning to learn their uh, AI agent. And so for data splits, this is a very important concept. Training sets should not be used in testing and test sets should not be used in learning. Yeah, of course, we all know that. Um, and unseen test set provides an unbiased estimate of model performance. And test set is usually hidden, so you won't have the labels. So for example, in the ImageNet uh, challenge, the test set is hold out and uh, well, in other challenges, what they did is that before the deadline, oh, like only a week before the deadline, they will release uh, the image you want to test on, and and that's all the time you have to run your mod, uh, run your model. And they don't have the label, so you have to submit the label to a leaderboard to get the uh, to get the accuracy. And usually, they limit the times you can submit to a, to the leaderboard because th that way you can avoid they could avoid you to sort of, so we have a, so for example, you have a hyperparameter of like the size of a model like 10 or 100, you 10 to 100, you keep te testing on the leaderboard to find optimal uh, parameters. That's not allowed uh, in many of the leaderboard nowadays to prevent you from gaming the system. So, um, Yes, so in this example, uh, this is an unfold cross-validation example. So in cases where you don't have a lot of data, people usually do five-fold cross-validation. Uh, what the cross-validation means that they first um, partition the data into equal size chunk. You can see here this data set, so for example, uh, there's like five, five class and there are 10 images per class. So they will divide, divide the data set into five fold and they will test on each of the fold. So for example, in the first, uh, first experiment, you, what you do is you train on fold one to fold four and test on fold five. So you repeat that five times and then you add, you and then you average the accuracy you get from this five experiment. This is usually what people do in like economy, data science, where they don't have a lot of data. So yeah, quick question, quick, a small quiz. So suppose we have a task of emotion recognition. So given a video of person classifying to happy or unhappy. So given a video output, happy or unhappy. So we have 100 videos of five people labeled happy or unhappy. So 20 videos for each person. So we randomize the 100 videos and set 80 videos for training, validation, and 20 for testing. Is this a good way? Should we do that? Anyone? No? Why do you think not? Um, I'm not sure is that, um, anyone else? So, yeah, so the reason why is that um, if we just randomize these 100 videos and put them 80 in for training and 20 for testing, it might, we might put the videos of the same person into training set and test set. Is that what you mean? Yeah, so, yeah, so we shouldn't do that because 
we have 20 video for each person, right? If you just directly randomize that and put them into train, so you might end up have uh, the same person in training and have the same person in testing. That means your test accuracy is biased because your model already seen what this person, uh, what his uh, look, happiness looks like and what his unhappiness looks like. So if I give, give you another strange person for your model, your model won't perform as well. Yeah, just keep in mind that when you do experiments, always keep in mind the careful about the bias in your data and your data speeds. Yeah. So K nearest neighbor classifier. So I will go through this really fast. So for each task, one professor told us that you always should first thing you after given a task, always think about K nearest neighbor. Can we just solve this with this easiest uh, simplest classifier. So for k near uh, neighbor classifier, the way to do it is given the test image, um, we classify that image based on the k closest training image labels. The complexity is on, n is the training set size, because for each test image you have to compare the test image with all the images in the training set. So what is K means? So um, if we set K equal five, given a test image, we compare this test image with all the training set images and we rank them based on the distance. And this is the rank. We, if we have K equal five, we will look at the top, top five images. And as we can see, there are two dogs, one sheep, one deer, one cat in these uh, five images. So according to the majority voting, we will label this test image as dog. Yeah, that's the KNN method. So we have a hyperparameter, K. So if you remember, we, we usually split our data into training set, validation set, and test set. So validation set is for us to determine the best K, the hyperparameters. Yeah, what do we, how do we determine closest? How do we compute the distance? So given the input and output, the, the two image you compare is a H times W times three tensor, two tensor. I'm sure you're uh, familiar with uh, the distance matrix. One is L1 distance, the second one is L2 distance. These are the two distant, uh, distance metrics we use a lot nowadays in computer vision, especially. Yeah, simply you can compute it with a NumPy package. I'm sure you know that. Um, yeah, so KNN classifier, they, uh, it doesn't need any training, but the test complexity is too high. So usually in practical machine learning application, we want an O1 test classifier. It is fine to have a slow training. So we go into the linear classifier case. This is the most simple, simple and practical classifier. And as later you will see, this is the building box of many uh, other models like neural networks. So we, we represent this linear classifier as a f of xi and w equals w multiplied by xi. So just a simple metric multiplication. So in this case, given an image which is a 32 by 32 by three tensor, the first thing we need to do is to flatten the images, image tensor into one vector because we have, in here, W is a matrix and X has to be a, a vector. It doesn't have to be, but yeah, in this case, uh, we first flatten the image into a vector. And suppose our target is to do a 10 class classification. The W here is, the W will be the dimension of 10 times uh, 3,000, and 72.
this is the input feature size, and 10 is the classification, uh, the number of class. And your input is this dimension, and then after a uh, metric multiplication, you get a ten, 10 numbers, which is the scores of the multi-class multi classification results. So since metric multiplication is very fast, given n images to test, to test, we can just run it once, one, one uh, metric multi multiplication, and then we have the result for all the test image. So a little bit about how to interpret the W matrix. Each row on this uh, W matrix is a single class classifier. See? So here, for one row, it is a 3072 dimension uh, vector. Each weight, what we call each weight in this row means how important it is, how important the, this, dimen this feature dimension is to the, for example, the first class. You will find this very useful if you have a SVM classifier and you want to um, interpret it. Because if you're familiar with SVM, you know you can change it from the dual from dual form to primal form, which means you can convert a SVM model into a linear classifier like this form. So you use just a W times a XI, and then you can use this uh, learned way to interpret your model. So basically, know uh, what does the model learn? What does the model? Which dimension of the feature does the model think is important? Yeah, and I guess you guys you are very familiar with optimization problem and loss function. You go through it very fast. So, what is a loss function? So, for a optimization problem, an optimization problem is to minimize a loss function. Loss function tells how bad our uh, current model is. So, if you want to, you will find that in many. If you're writing a paper, most many of the t many times, the novelty is uh, is in how you define, how you design a loss function for your problem. And in this case, for image classification, we design a loss function to find the optimal model weight W. So given this data set of n image and label pairs. And our linear classifier is rep represented by this. The loss over the data set is an average of loss over each example. So you can compute a loss for each uh, Im image and label pairs. And the loss function is not def defined yet here. So if you are familiar with SVM, we'll, this is the hinge loss that SVM use. The intuition of uh, SVM hinge loss is that um, here this minus means that the, the SJ is the scores for the SVM to give to the uh, other class. Uh, SYI is the score of the correct class. If we want to Minimize this loss means that the loss is. It means that the model will give gives higher scores for the correct class than the rest class. So basically, you have a margin between the scores of the correct class and the other class. This is the loss function's intuition, which proved to be very useful, like for many years. Um. Yeah. So for the linear classifier, we have to first learn about the softmax function. As you can see here, the output of the linear classifier, it is not a valid um, uh, probability distribution, which means it's not sum to one. We'll use a softmax function to make the score to sum to one. Yeah, I will skip this. 
you guys are all familiar with submax function, right? You get the the idea is to make all the output scores into to sum to one, so that is a valid probability distribution. You can apply this to a SVM output as well. So after you have a valid, uh, valid probability distribution, we can use the uh, negative log likelihood loss to, uh, it is also known as cross entropy loss for classification problem. The intuition is that, well, uh, the loss intuition is that we will compare the ground truth um, probability distribution in this case, the ground truth is dark, so the probability of the ground truth probability distribution, the all the probability mass is in the dark class. You want to compare it to your uh, label output. So th the loss for this case is 0 0.095. And you can imagine that for a perfect classifier, if you output the probability of the dog is one, you will get a loss of zero. So, now that we have the loss, now that we know when our model performed very bad, we will optimize it. And we will use gradient descent. This is a very basic concept. You just need to know that very, on a very high level, since you never need to do it yourself. Um, so, gradient descent. Gradient is the direction of the fastest uh, increase of a function at a point. So gradient descent means that take the negative direction. We want to minimize something. So usually in the neural networks or, uh, or the, in general gradient descent optimization, the first step is to compute the gradient of the loss function with respect to the weight, current model weight. And then you apply the gradient to update the model weight. Know that Right, uh, as I mentioned before, what we want to do is find the optimal model weight for our problem. And the loss function tells you how bad your model does, so you get a gradient that means which direction you should tr try to optimize your model weight. And you minus that. And this guy here is the learning rate, uh, commonly in uh, neural networks. And if you know papers like Adagrad, IMS crop, momentum, they all focus on how to compute this learning rate as you train your model. Yeah, and here the N is the whole data set, but in practice we can't do that because usually the N is huge. So that's why uh, we, in neural network training, we um, Sample mini batch n equals thirty two sixty four one hundred, and therefore we call it stochastic gradient descent. Yes, this is the algorithm, high level algorithm of optimization in neural networks, and then iteration is um, one mini batch training. And epoch is when we have looked through all the data. Usually, we, uh, for example, in object detection, people usually train for a couple epoch. That means go through the data set a couple times. So how does the linear classifier relate to neural networks? So after we remember our linear classifier is uh, w multiplied by x i. Now we add an activation function, which is a max of zero and w multiplied by x. A two-layer neural network, or what we call fully connected layer, multi-layer perception, is just adding another weight on top of the first uh, function. So anyone know why do we need uh, an activation function to have uh, multiple layer neural networks? Anyone? So what happens if we don't have an activation function? So 
imagine if we don't have that uh, max max of zero, it will become what what does the two layer neural network looks like? It will become W two multiplied by W one multiplied uh, by X i. So the W two and W one will collapse into one weight matrix, which means it will eventually becomes one layer linear classifier. So sort of it will collapse. That's why people add an activation function at each layer of the neural networks. And the activation function is a nonlinear uh, function so that they won't collapse together. Yeah, so neural network is just a building blocks of this kind of linear classifier and activation function. So in the case of the image classification, uh, if we have a two layer neural networks, it will look like this. We put the uh, input image into a vector and go through these two layer multi uh, two layer neural networks and get a 10 class scores. But there's a problem. The spatial information is lost. Since we flatten the whole tensor into one vector, so we go into convolution neural networks. Nowadays, all almost all modern deep learning models in computation use CNNs, and the main difference to fully connected layer is that the we input the input is with spatial dimension, and output is also with uh, spatial dimensions. This is an example of the dimension change for input and output. You can see we input the whole image into the CNN layers. The output would be, uh, the spatial dimension will keep the same. And this is the C, C meaning the number of filters. This is the hyperparameters. And the convolution operation looks like this. You can find more detailed explanation in the, this link here. And from here is a, a dimension chain perspective to understand the convolutional neural networks layer. On the right here, this is the TensorFlow input, uh, the TensorFlow function's um, parameters. The input is a spatial tensor, which is, for example, 32 times 32 times 3. And the filters is. Uh, of three times three times 64. And the kernel size is a three, three by, uh, the, three, uh, the kernel size uh, parameter is if it is three by three and you want to have 64 filters, you will get a model weight of three by three by 64. This is what TensorFlow saved in its model. This is what the uh, model weight dimension is. And so intuitively, it means 64 weight is sum of all three by three area. So you can imagine the, yeah, just like the image here, this is one filter, and you do it for all the filters you want, you have. And in this case, we set padding to same and stride to one. You will get the same spatial output but however, the output dimension is changed from three to 64. That's the number of filters. Yeah. And one very important uh, CNN is the residual neural networks. You can see this is the model description and this is uh, one part of it. They are all convolution layers except the last layer. So all layers are convolution layers and the last layer is just a fully connected layer for 1,000 class image classification because it is for the image neck uh, challenge. Nowadays, for many tasks, we still use it for a low-level feature extraction because the output before the last layer is, for example, 4,096 dimension. You can directly use that as, your, as the input to your classifier, and it, you will get very good results. It's usually the baseline system we, we try. Okay, 
Any question for image classification? Okay, then I will explain. Uh, I will show some more interesting um, computer vision tasks that me and my group um, have uh, done. So, including video classification, the data set include kinetics, FCBID, UCF 101, and image and video object detection. Uh, multi-model question answering and person future de prediction. So first, video classification. I think this is uh, very closely related to your homeworks. And um, so, what is video classification? That is very similar to image classification, but the difference is just given a uh, video itself an image. Um, the model has to output one class label and usually it is a multi-class classification problem. What is a, here is a strong baseline. So for, since the video is variable length, usually, we want to have a fixed length feature input. What we do is that for each, ima for image, uh, for each video, we extract 30 frames uniformly, which means that if it is a long video, we have a larger frame gap, right? we extract 30 frames no matter how long the video is. And then we extract CNN features for each frame. The CNN feature is, in this case, 4096 dimension, which is from a re residual net pre-trained on image net data set. Um, so you have 30, you have this uh, input tensor of 4096 dim uh, times 30, what we, what we do is very simple. We just average all the features for, for all the frames. And then this 4096 would be the representation of this video. And then you can just input this feature into uh, your choice of classifier. And usually in your homework, the case is that um, the training set is very small. You only have 10 videos. So in this case, you will have only 10 vectors for training. So you would want to use SVM. But um, yeah, here is an example inference code on GitHub. What we did is that we train video classification model on all this uh, data set. It includes UCF 101, uh, kinetics, and SV SCVID. Uh, this, is, this is an example video. So it is a girl playing hula hoop. And you can see the classic, uh, classification score here. You can see the hula hoop is very high score, which is correct. But you can see the second score, baby crawling. This is actually correct, because you can see the ba there's a baby here. See that? Yeah, so you can use it as uh, features and you can use it as, you can use it for low level feature extraction or you can even use the output of this model. Yeah. Um, so when you're trading on top of the features you get from the retina, are you just trading that classifier itself? You're not like back processing? Yeah, yeah. so we, what we do um, in practice, it meant like, usually we don't backprop the, um, backprop to the whole network. And in an engineering perspective, we usually save those, we extract this feature and save the feature. We throw the model away. This is easier for experiment because you can save all the feature here, you fix the features, and then you change all the classifier you want to try. And in this case, we use a multi-layer perceptron we didn't use uh, SVM because in, uh, these are the big uh, video classific classification data set. Uh, they have ample, they have enough uh, data videos for you to train uh, neural networks. Um, yeah. So you can see uh, for each data, for example, in UCF 101, our model will output 101 uh, class scores for each video. 
Yeah, so you can use this code for low-level feature extraction. The CNN model we use called uh, Inception ResNet V2, which is like say of the uh, in 2017, it's sort of combining Inception Net and ResNet. But it's not the best now, but you can still, it's still a very strong CNN features. You can use uh, uh, the code to, for example, a video like this, you extract CNN feature for a number of frames, and then you average them, you get a fixed length representation of your video. And then you can apply your classifier here. But another way to use it, uh, I think it's more interesting, is to use the output of the semantic uh, labels. What do I mean by that? So remember we have all these models trained on the FCBID, uh, this kind of data set, right? The output is, uh, for example, in this data, data set YFCC 609, the output dimension is 609. Each dimension has a semantic label. Uh, for example, here, dancing, crawling, moving, is kind of uh, the verb. So if you use this output to your model and train, uh, for example, a linear classifier, as I mentioned before, you can use this uh, linear classifier, this is one layer classifier to interpret uh, what your model have, uh, has learned. For example, if you use this output to uh, classify events, for example, making a cake, maybe in the weight matrix, you, you will find that, oh, somehow, uh, somehow a baby might be related to making a cake. <laughs> Sometimes. You, it's very interesting to look into the model. It's usually counterintuitive, but I guess it's just, it's just a fun, fun way to look at linear classifier. Yeah, yeah, you can try, try it yourself. All right, um, any questions on video classification? Yeah, this is, would be a very strong baseline. You can try, try to use that for your homework. Um, it is the full output class score of that model. So 400 is from the kinetic data set. That's, uh, they are all activity labels. So you can imagine your input, uh, given a video, I have a 400 dimension saying that, okay, maybe this video is about uh, walking a dog. And you use that 400 dimension scores as your uh, your input to your classifier, the input to your classifier. That makes sense. Somehow, the which means the classifier will learn the mapping between walking a dog to the event you are going to classify. Yeah, so it would be very fun to use. Yeah. Um, why is this better than just directly mapping a CNN feature into your data set? No, it's not. Um, from our experiment, it's not, um, this is not always the case that low level CN feature is better. So in the case where training set is very few, for example, 10, model, 10 videos, and you use the low level feature as input versus using this sort of semantic feature as input, the semantic feature will be way better. As you, because intuitively, this, already, this model already sort of learned from a large data, data set that learned to map a low level image feature to some semantic meaningful features. And, and then your, for example, SVM, it's easier for the SVM to learn from this kind of semantic input than the low level CNN so feature. It's like you have a lot of videos of people like crawling yeah, like Wait. low level, sort of a low level um, like atomic. Basic yeah, yeah, basic yeah. event, atomic event. Videos of people baking cake. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Okay. yeah, but I would encourage you to do experiments. It would be more interesting to see that yourself.
Okay, for image and video object detection now. So different from image classification, the object detection task is to, it has to find a bounding box or segmentation for each object in the image. You can see you have, to, you have to output the bounding box for the bike, for the car. So one image, you have to have multiple bounding box classification. And yes, one of the popular method is the feature pyramid network on top of, a, on top of the ResNet. The intuition is that utilize feature at different resolution. So the, what the ResNet does is, given a high resolution image, it will slowly shrink, uh, shrink the uh, spatial resolution. But if we utilize the feature at different resolution, the performance of object detection would be better. So this is the ResNet on the left here. What the feature pyramid does is that it uses the features from different level, which means different resolution. And then they predict the object location based on different level of features. Yeah, this is a very high level, uh, high level explanation of this paper. And our group also, also have a, a project for video object detection and tracking. This is used in surveillance video. You can see that for video object detection, you actually have, yeah, look at here, you actually need to not only have a bounding box, but you also have to have an ID for each bounding box, which means that this is the vehicle before. Yeah. Um, so right there, the, the stationary car, it seems like the box yeah. Yes. Um, that is a very good question. Um, so first, you see that object detection tracking is not perfect, <laughs> and the reason why is that it, I think it relates to the how the video is compressed. There's a lot of noise that we cannot see. And somehow our the object detection model now they even pre-trained on a really large data set like MS Coco, they are still biased towards some hidden things that we don't we don't see in the images. As you can see, it from our eye, the video does not change at all, but the bounding box changes. But if you look closely, there's a lot of small like noises in the in the images, in the video, and that's. Actually, what the this is the normal case in more modern application in surveillance video. They are always noisy, and one way to combat this is called adversarial learning. So, if you are interested, you can search that. So, basically, what they try to do is to augment the input, so to so sort of give give noise to the training data set and learn a robu more robust model. Yeah, so this is a problem in the tracking. Uh, different object detection gives all the bounding box. For tracking, what the tracking does is to associate different bounding box, right? This goes to how do you associate a bounding box before to a bounding box later. People, the strong baseline, they use the location of the bounding box. So if the bounding box stayed at the same area, it's likely to be the same track, the same ID. And then secondly is the appearance. So they will compare the CNN feature of each, the two bounding box, and then associate them. So um, yeah, it's not perfect, because the, the CNN feature is not perfect, so you can't ha always have a good, uh, you can't have a good as association. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so for tracking, you're using some port Mm. So you can see the code there. There's a, a, a high level explanation that what we use is deep sort. Okay. Yeah. So basically, we use the CNN feature from the object detection, which is the ResNet, and then use that use the cosine similarity between bounding boxes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And 
Yeah. Um, the common filter is for predicting the bounding box location and the match the uh, association association. Yeah. Okay. Any questions? Um, then we'll move on to another task, which is uh, multimodal question answering. This is more multimedia taste. Um, so, are you guys familiar with uh, visual question answering task, which is very popular two years ago? <laughs> Maybe still popular. So the task is to uh, give an image here, and then and a question. For example, what kind of store is this? And the output answer is you have to have a model to output the answer bakery. So this is sort this is kind of a very general question answering task. It's very high level. You can't use it for any system. So you would not ask for example, you have a lot of images in your cell phone. You wouldn't ask your cell phone that this image you have a for example, if this is me, I would not ask Siri that what kind of store is this? It's not useful at all for practical uses for a VQA system. Um, so we propose a sort of more real world uh, question answering task. So in real world uh, personal media, it looks like this. So if you uh, use a sort of a online photo management system, uh, website like Flickr, people will put all the photos in one album, a set, a collection of photos, and they will write down this kind of dis description and title, and they have the time and location of that sort of event. You can see here is a person, I think this is from real user. So this photo album is when they go to New Orleans and for some kind of festival, right? And imagine this user want to sort of recall his or her memory, and they will ask question like, "What did we? What did I do in New Orleans?" And then your system has to answer the uh, to answer correctly, and imagine what the system has to do, right? The system has to recognize that the New Orleans is the location, so he has, the model has to look into the uh, location modality, and then look into the content about what the person has done, right? So you can't directly use traditional VQA methods in this case. And secondly, um, we will question answering need justification. For example, if I ask my cell phone, when was the last time we went to a bar? And then this, for example, skip Siri just tell me that uh, on January 20, 2006, you would not be satisfied because you, okay, I don't remember that, right? You want the system to find that photo. You have some kind of justification why the answer is January 20, 2006. So we propose a focal visual test attention model. And I think this paper could be very useful for you to sort of go into attention model in sequence modeling. Basically, you have a model that uh, can output the answer and also have the attention to tell you why the model gives that output. And for this model, attention is computed based on the similarity between uh, the question and the focal context representation. So the whole pipeline of the system is like this. So in this case, this is the photo album of a person. Um, each photo has a title, Mother's Day, end of year party, uh, the location is New York, and for that photo is people drinking at a bar on January 20th, 2006. The question is, when was the last time we went to a bar? The system will output the correct answer. 
which is January 20, 2006, and then also have the highest attention score on this image, people drinking in the bar. Yeah. OK. That's for uh, question on multimodal question answering. So if you are interested in the, you can use it. You can, if you're interested in this, you can do it in your final project, I guess. Yeah. Later, I think Alex will have more, um, they have more presentation on each each task of each task. Yeah. Um, so s now for uh, one of our recent research uh, topic is. Um, Person future prediction. What does it does? Um, what we're trying to do here is to predict trajectories or activities in surveillance video. We call it extended videos. Um, so in this case, a video a camera is looking at a parking lot. You see the person on, on the top right corner. He walks for, uh, for example, if we observe him walking for four seconds, the task is to predict the future path of this person and also the activities of the, this person. So you can see here there's two plausible ta uh, paths for this person. One is to walk to the uh, white car, and the second is to go to the person uh, at the bottom left corner, and uh, based on the different location, uh, the possible activities are different. So basically what we did is we use, utilize this kind of rich visual features, right? Because uh, to predict a per person's future activities, their appearance and their behavior could be a very good uh, indicator. So for example, in this case, you can see the person is holding a box. So it might, it's likely that he will hand it to somebody or put it in the car. And also, other person in the scene is also, in, uh, also useful for prediction. You can see this person uh, is waving. Not clear there, but the guy is waving uh, there. So it's very likely that the person will go to him. So this is the uh, qualitative uh, result of our model. In this case, a person with a luggage uh, walked to the stop sign. There's a stop sign there. The cars kind of slow down. And our model successfully predict that the person will walk towards the car door, the back door of the car, and open door and load the uh, luggage into the car. And here in the second example, uh, we correctly predict that the, this person is going to gesture to the person on the left. So you can see that this is a very near future prediction. We, the experiment setting is to observe 3.2 seconds and predict the next 4.8 seconds of videos. This is the common experiment setting in this view. Um, we are not able to predict further future yet. That is not the model that predict, for example, 20 seconds later is not working at all right now. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so, according to you, what is like the best implementation to, uh, uh, to feed in the past prediction? For example, like you were talking about you are inputting 3.2 seconds. So, mm -hmm. is it like compensated or like just frames? Yeah, so um, it definitely won't work if you directly input the frames and try to. Mm -hmm ask the model to learn itself. So in our paper, we found that it's good to have multiple features. So here what we use first is person behavior. It includes the uh, CNN feature of the person bounding box and also the key point of the uh, person. So if you're familiar with post estimation, the output of that model is the skeleton of a person. And then Secondly, is the person interaction module where we input the scene semantic segmentation of the, uh, of the scene. So the scene semantic segmentation output is pixel classification of the whole frame, right? So here, this yellow 
is a uh, mean sidewalk, and the gray thing is row. So you can imagine knowing where the sidewalk is will help the prediction. Yeah. And yeah, there's a lot of input features in this model. And we found that if I want to say the most important thing, I think would be the scene semantics. Um, yeah, so we directly use all the, the whole frames output. Right. We don't do any background subtraction. Um, yeah, in this case, we actually need the background. We need to know where the sidewalk is, where the row is. Because yeah, I'm just talking about foreground and background separation. If we just need the, 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 the semantic of uh, background, does having object help or not? I was just wondering. Oh, okay. Uh, I guess. For background subtraction, it's actually a very low-level computer vision task where they would remove everything that does not move. So after background subtraction, for example, in OpenCV, you will only left with the person that's moving. Other, other part would be blank. So I guess, yeah. Um, We also use the bounding box of other objects in the scene. We also find that it's useful because you can, as you can see here, if you know there's a two cars in the scene, that would be useful for uh, your prediction. Two cars and a person in the scene, that would be useful. Yeah. they sort of complementary to the scene semantic features. Because scene semantic features from existing model would be noisy. They are not perfect. The bounding box, the person detection and vehicle detection is very good. Yep. Um, how do you take account for like a variable size of distance? Like if there's like five cars mm -hmm. and six people. Yeah, so um, yeah, like yeah, you can look at the, the papers. What we do is, that's one part of the features. Uh, for the bounding box, we only take the top 15 closest bounding box to the target person. In this case, the target person is on Top, top yeah. yeah, so another extension of this problem. So look at this video. As a human, if you look at the person walk like this, and you might predict that he's likely to get into any car, right? But in fact, this person will walk through the parking lot. Let me see, let us see that again. So tell me your prediction of the person. Right? You might think he could go into any car. But in fact, he walks straight down to the uh, corner of the parking lot and wait for another car. So sort of, this tells us that the future is uncertain. The future is uncertain and the real world videos only provide one sample. Um, since Previous, uh, previously, we trained on this kind of real, real world video. That means that your model only looks at this possibility, right? So you sort of bias your model into thinking that the person would do as in the real world video. But in, for example, self-driving um, application, you want a model that predict all the possibility of the pedestrian. And the missing part is a data set that could provide all this kind of multi-future, what we call multiple future possibilities. And yeah, we'll ignore the model, but what we did is that we use 3D simulation and ask human annotators to produce multi-future multi data. So imagine in this case, so if you are playing a video game, like the whole scene is uh, reconstructed in a, in a game, in a 3D simulation. What we did is we asked human annotator to control this guy, to walk into a car, or walk straight, walk straight to the end of the parking lot. So, you, so we can record multiple possibility in this scenario. 
yeah, so it's, it's just a fun, I think it's a pretty fun project that, so first, first we, we construct the scene into 3D simulation. This is a simulation. Uh, the, simula uh, the engine we use is Unreal Engine, which is the engine that behind Fortnite. And it is open source, so we use it for research. And so this is an example of our data set. This, this is the target person. You can see it's sort of split. <laughs> sort of the a multiverse <laughs> concept that uh, this is a visualize of all the human annotator. So what we did, when we collect the data, uh, the, person will con the human will control this guy in a first person perspective. And they are given the task of walking to the car, but they have to avoid other agents in the scene. You can see there's a car coming, right? So sort of, uh, we construct the scene to simulate real world response from human. So look at the car coming, and they sort of avoid the car. So that's what we try to sort of reconstruct the real world scenario. Meanwhile, we can ask human to perform different kinds of um, possible, possible trajectories. <coughs> yeah. So yeah, I think it's uh, pretty fun. But the, the thing we found is that nowadays the simulation is not good enough. You can see it's quite fake, right? At least it's not to my standard. You can see that the person kind of, yeah, the animation of the person is pretty bad. And this is, this is the best open source simulation we have nowadays. If you have played GTA 5, <laughs> um, that's completely different. You can see that it's completely different. But the problem is that GTA 5, those animation, those reflection, and those things are produced by manually. They're produced by artists. They have to put in all these shaders, all these animation, tweak them to make them realistic. And they are not open source. So we, can't use, we, we can never use that. Um, yeah, so that's the state of the simulation. I guess I can see that in the future, maybe with all the APIs slowly uh, open source and have all the APIs for controlling the agent and sort of moving the shading, shader, uh, moving all this, uh, for example, the road, the grass, uh, maybe it will get better. Yeah. Yep. Uh, so the simulation of design? Yeah, so you can look at the, um, in this paper, what we try to do is to create a benchmark for multi-future prediction. So it is not used for training yet. So we want to, what we want to do is have a quantitative analysis of this multi-future trajectory problem. But in our paper, we also, we also done experiment on using, the, using this data for training and test on the real data. There's a degrade, there's a performance drop, but the, but the drop is not significant. So you can imagine that, and as in our later research, that learning from simulation will actually help. Because in many cases, you don't have real world data. For example, a person got hit by a car. That's a really rare event. Yeah. So I thought that um, automakers like such the self-driving car company, they were investing a decent amount for simulation. Mm -hmm. uh, do you know whether they're doing similar things in the industry or? Yeah, so it, our work is based on uh, CARLAR. Okay. This is a, a self-driving benchmark for like two years now. So this is based on the latest simulation in self-driving industry. At least this is what Intel and uh, and there are a couple companies that what they released. Okay. Yeah, Waymo maybe have their internal 
I'm sure many big companies have their internal simulation, but Carla, this one that we use is uh, the best in open source. The best that's open source, yeah. Yeah, okay, so today I introduce you to some really basic stuff and all the other fun tasks you can do with computer vision, video classification, object detection, and question answering, and person, uh, person prediction. Yeah, do you have any questions? Okay, and if you can access Assess the slides. There are uh, co-repositories for all the tasks, and you can try them for yourself.